your involvement is critical to the success of the business, but also be sensitive to creating a collaborative environment um, such that other people can make a stamp on um, the business. The other, like I said before, is start early. The earliest time time to start was yesterday. Um, That's the best time. And the next best time is today. It's never too early to start your legacy journey. And by that, if you've got young children or um, any children, it just starts with exposing them to the business, um, starting to have conversations on the meaning of the business, the meaning of the family wealth, the meaning of the family name, the wider vision, um, the wider purpose. These conversations don't, uh, they're not routine. (laughs) They don't happen by osmosis. Um, These are conversations we have to plan for. You're listening to the Black to Business podcast, an educational podcast providing Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses. We chat with vetted Black entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business owners as they provide tips and resources to help take your business to the next level. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall. I think that at the end of the day, most of us want to have a business that's around for the long haul and one that we can pass off to the next generation. So let's talk about doing business with family. And I'm not talking about the ones asking for a discount or the ones who don't support you, but let's actually have a positive conversation. When I say doing business with family, I mean actually starting a business with family, actually hiring family and actually intentionally building a legacy. For many, starting a family business can be a blessing because it's a great way to make money while also building a strong family connection. However, for others, it can be a curse because the family business can't be managed properly. Then it becomes a source of internal family conflicts and disturbed egos. And we all know how that ends. With that being said, it's important to put the proper plans and boundaries in place so that you are on a path to creating a lasting business legacy. Today, we've invited Nikkei Anini on the show to discuss building a family business and important things to know about legacy planning. Nikkei is rated as a top 100 family business consultant globally. She helps her clients bridge the gap between the senior and younger generations so that there is better communication, collaboration, and collective clarity to increase productivity and profits in the family business. We invited Nikkei on the show because legacy building is something we believe is very important and also understanding how impactful family businesses are within our community is important. During this conversation, we're touching on all of that. So let's dive into it. Before we get into today's episode, I want to announce that we've reopened the applications for our directory, The Connect. We're looking for businesses that provide professional services that will be beneficial to our target audience of entrepreneurs who are in their startup journey. So if that sounds like your business, you may now submit your business to be listed by visiting blacktobusiness.com forward slash the connect. Applications are open every four months and we're now accepting applications for businesses for 2022. So to give you a little more information about the directory and how you can apply, The reason we created The Connect is to provide business owners with the resources needed to grow their businesses. And being that Black to Business is a platform that assists aspiring Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses, we are often asked for recommendations for industry experts who can assist these entrepreneurs with their business needs. So we wanted to create a solution. We want to include businesses who are doing the work. And if that sounds like you, we want to help promote your business to assist you in increasing your exposure, but also letting people know about the work that you're doing to continue to push forward Black-owned businesses. So head over to blacktobusiness.com forward slash deconnect to apply. Now let's get into the episode. So Nikkei Rick, welcome to the Black to Business podcast. I'm so excited to have you and I'm excited about today's topic. So welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Of course. So Nikkei, before we get started, I always ask my guests, if you could just discuss a little bit about who you are, what is it that you do in your business, and how did you get where you are today? 
Hmm. Yes, um, I am a speaker. I'm an author. I'm a legacy planning consultant. I help business owners take their businesses from lifetime businesses to legacy businesses. And really how I got started was very much inspired by my personal journey. I was born into a business family. So my father started our first family business the year I was born and um, back in Lagos in Nigeria. And um, at the age of nine, I moved to the UK. So I was quite far removed from the business. My dad stayed back and continued to build it out. And after university and after a brief career in corporate, I decided to come back to Nigeria and work alongside him. And so by this point, it had evolved into a construction business, a real estate development company and an engineering firm. And there were over 3000 members of staff. So integrating into the business was um, interesting. Lots of change. Um, change geographically from the UK to Nigeria, change in culture um, and change in business environment as well. And there was very little assistance available to help family businesses navigate change, transition, as well as generational change, because we were starting to think about legacy planning, um, ensuring that the business would outlive my dad, outlive me. But there was no one on the ground that had the skill sets. Um, to assist us on that journey. And so I ended up training with Family Firm Institute in Boston and um, becoming a legacy advisor, put together the succession planning for my family, the family governance, and then realized that, oh, there were many families like mine. Um, over 90% of businesses in Nigeria were family businesses, but only 2% would make it beyond the lifetime of the founder. And there was an innate need to help these folks with building legacy businesses. So that started my journey as a legacy advisor. I was back in Nigeria for 10 years. And I recently just moved to Austin, Texas, um, literally three months ago. So it's a season of new beginnings yet again. More <laughs> change. But I'm still very much involved in the legacy planning space. I love that. And I, I want to talk about, um, you know, because I know people who are listening, one of the things that we always want to push is, of course, like you said, like legacy building. And just I don't think we talk about enough family businesses. I know a lot of people are just doing it right now. And they're like, OK, I'm just worried about getting it off the ground for me. But I want to start off discussing um what do you think separates, you know, what makes a family business and mm. the the pros of having and thinking about, you know, legacy building? Mm. Great question. I think oftentimes people, when they hear the word family business, it comes with a negative connotation. Mm. So lots of people disqualify themselves like, no, I'm not building a, a family business. They will often say, I, 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 I'm not building a small business. Um, but the reality is um, over 80% of global GDP is generated by family firms. And they are they range from the small corner shop to your large conglomerates. Household names like Walmart is a family firm, BMW, Audi, Ferragamo, um, so many huge companies are family businesses. What distinguishes a family business from a corporate is that family businesses are usually controlled in shareholding, so more than 50% of the shareholders are um, individuals as opposed to institutionals. And or two or more family members are working together in the business. That's a de like legal, so to speak, definition of these businesses. But what does that mean in practice and what's the implications of that? Is that typically when individuals are building a business for the benefit of the family to put food on the table to provide financial security they tend to be more long-termist in their views and in their outlook than a, a company that's obsessed with quarterly earnings so they tend to have um, more patient capital and also tend to be more agile and nimble able to move fast go after opportunities, and also think beyond, typically think beyond just shareholder maximization. 
Um, think through to stakeholder maximization, think about the communities in which they serve. So essentially the quantitative is just as important as a qualitative. Um, sorry, the qualitative is just as important as a quantitative. By that, I mean, for a lot of family firms, their reputation in communities is really important. Their network is really important. Their name is really important the welfare of their employees, the welfare of the communities in which they serve um, are just as important as seeing that revenue and profits are growing. Mm, mm-hmm. Love it. And so, well, I know that, you know, you're currently in Texas and you spent time in Nigeria and also the UK. So I want to get a perspective of overall, like when it comes to, of course, our audiences, Black entrepreneurs, what do you think the current state of these family-owned businesses are for our communities? I think there's several nuances, um, but just generally across the Black African diaspora, across the Black community, across the pond, we've not been great at generational businesses and generational wealth. Um, That's one. We've not been intentional about investing in the resources to ensure that we build businesses that would outlive, outlast us. Not only have we not been intentional about getting the resources, we've not been intentional about social capital, about coming together in community, learning from one another, sharing with one another, um, and really to transition successfully. The studies have shown that the most successful family businesses is not just because of their financial capital, the performance of revenues and profits, cash in the bank, you know, um, size of their assets, but also because of their social capital, the access which they have, um, you know, access to opportunities, access to resources, um, intellectual resources human resources, financial resources to be able to take the business to the next level. So those two key areas are key areas that distinguish us as a community. Um, Obviously, we as a community, we are at a huge disadvantage to other communities. Um, For those in Africa, there was colonialism up until just 60, 70 years ago. And so we are really just starting from afresh and getting to grips with building our businesses and learning, going on our journey towards legacy. And and on on this side of the world, there's been a lot of institutionalized racism and continues to be. So there are many barriers to overcome. However, in spite of these obstacles and limitations, I do believe that there's scope for us to do more work and being intentional about building generational wealth um, because the antidote to generational poverty is generational wealth. And if you look at most wealthy families across the world, their source of wealth typically comes from a business somewhere, a business that um, outlived a founder. So it's important that we, we also focus on doing the same. I totally agree. And it's, it's also like, you know, like you said, you can't just plan for you. You have to plan for the future. But I also think about, you know, encouraging people, even if they don't want to start a business, they're like, oh, I don't want to start a business. It's important to start even just as a side hustle. And like you said, most of the wealth is coming from businesses. Um, generational wealth is coming from business creation. So I'm glad that you spoke about that. And also, like you mentioned, some of the barriers and things that we face um, for those people who are listening and they're not understanding, OK, this is what I want to do, but I'm just trying to live for the day and, mm-hmm. you know, for the day to day in my business. What are your thoughts and what would you say to someone that's thinking that? I would say, unfortunately, that is limiting the potential of your business and the longevity of your business. Mm-hmm. Um a common proverb we say in Africa is that if you want to know the end of something, look at the beginning. So you have to start with the end in mind. Um, I'm from a construction background, so I know that if we want to embark on a 15-storey building, we have to spend a lot of time on designing the foundation, 
the engineering studies, architectural drawings, et cetera. Um, so you, you can't just stumble on a, a construction project and just take it a day at a time and just whatever cash you have, buy some materials tomorrow and just build one section. It doesn't work that way. You have to have the whole picture. Um, and I would encourage the same thing. Legacy takes time. Legacy is like sowing a seed and carefully nurturing the seed. You might not see that, um, you might not see the immediate returns, the immediate results. It's, but there's change happening beneath the surface and suddenly it will bud and it might grow into a tree in your generation or it might grow into a tree in after you. But that's what legacy entails. It takes, it takes time to plan. It takes intentionality. And because, you know, right now you might be in a season where it's just you building a business, very soon you will start to think about, you know, wanting to retire, um, move, you know, shutting down the business, potentially selling the business and or passing on the helm and the responsibility of the business to a family member, the next generation or even non-family staff. But all those options require long term considered planning these are not decisions you can just make on the half so i would i always encourage that legacy planning is planning that is done from inception it's not something you retrofit at the point when you need to move on to something else because it takes time i was over here like yes 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 because <laughs> i love that you use that a building. And I always think about like laying a brick every day and having that proper foundation. I think especially in today's time, we get so caught up in fast returns on investments and people want the immediate return. And like you said, it's about, you know, thinking not just about me, but the future and the end in mind. So yes, I appreciate that. And I want to talk about now. I want you to answer this, Nikkei. Mm -hmm. Is every business to be a family-owned business? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily. So, for instance, if you're try going to welcome institutionals and they will own a majority of the business, say like a private equity business or VC, um, that's not a family business, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's different. However, there's a component of um, that that is a family business and that's the wealth that will be created from the business. Say, for instance, you earn 10% of a tech company and 90% you've raised cash from institutionals. And say in 10 years time, you're making, I don't know, $10 million um, in dividends for your 10%. Now, the business of managing that 10% is a business in itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. That 10 million that, you know, is now becomes an asset and you're now going to decide what am I going to invest that in? Um, and typically you take into consideration your family. That is a business. That's that's the a family office that goes into the realm of, you know, ensuring that you're providing financial security for your family members through investing, through risk management. So you might start to think about life insurances or real estate, um, you know, stocks and shares and your mutual funds. You might start to think about investing in art. You might start to think about collectibles and things like that. But that is a business in itself. Got it. OK, so let's talk about the nitty gritty. Um, someone who's listening is considering this. This is something that's been on their mind, you know, because we all realize the importance. And of course, people are managing multiple businesses. Some people are. Um, but I want to talk about some of the things to keep in mind before starting a family business. Any mm -hmm. tips? Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, to um, realize that you'll probably start off very informal. Um, however, there's a need to formalize and go down a journey of formalizing and institutionalizing. That is the only way to ensure that you're building a business that would outlive you. So um, you want to ensure that you're making yourself 
redundant and unemployed. If that makes sense. <laughs> Eventually, you want to not just be working in the business, you want to be working on business, on strategic matters, on um, legacy matters and what have you. So it's important that you have you have your foundations right. Your foundations will be human resources, finance and um, administration. You want to have processes um, so that if heaven forbid, anything happens to you, someone else can step in and there's a standard operating procedure manual and they know exactly what to do and take on from you. The second is you want to start to have clarity around policies with respect to family. So for instance, you might invite your sister or your brother to come help with the business on what, um, what's the terms of that engagement. Um, is that what's the job description? What are the payment terms? What's the amount? As much as possible, you want to make that as, you know, what would be obtainable in the in the market, right? A fair market wage for two reasons. Firstly, um, to motivate and fairly compensate your family for the work that they're doing because it's work, it's not just um, a favour. Right. Right. And secondly, so you don't have resentment on their part and blurriness of, you know, the world of family business is a confluence of family and business. Right. You don't want a spillover of the family relationship into the business relationship or the business relationship into the family relationship. And you want to be able to have a situation where if your brother or sister say, hey, I'm done, I'm resigning, you have a role. Um, that, you know, you have a, a vacancy that you can recruit someone for at a, a price that would mean you would get good talent. So it's really important to not get too bogged down into what I term as, you know, family favor thinking and really think about building a business, a business that is attractive and will retain good talent. You want to ensure that who, whoever you're picking to work with you is, is talent. Love that. Now, when you say, um, because I want to talk about, you know, having people in business as far as like family members who go into business with you versus also like just hiring family members. Um, mm-hmm. So in this case, would you say that that's more so like going into business with a family member versus just hiring them? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's hiring them, right? Mm-hmm. But usually what happens is even if it starts off um, two siblings going into business together, co-investing, after some time, you start to think of other family members that might want to join, say, for instance, your children. At right. some point, you might start saying you want them to intern or you want them to start working. Um, what if your children don't have the right skill set? Mm. for it or are not competent so it's important to ensure that you have entry criteria for family to work in the business and that might be qualifications work experience um, just as you would like when you're applying for a third-party job they would say we want someone of this background we want the character um, these are the characteristics and attributes we would like to see you want to outline that as well. Um, it's important that the family business is not seen as a free for all, um, where it's um, a birthright for family just to come in and have a job for life, but that they actually merit it. Um, they work for it. Um, so to create that that standard. Yes. I agree. And someone who is listening is probably like, I'm already in a family business and I'm figuring and I didn't start this way. I I did not start with those boundaries. So when someone is at that point, uh, what advice could you give them on, you know, setting those boundaries with their family as well as dealing with conflict? First, yeah, no. So firstly, it's important to have a HR and not just see HR as an administrative function, but a strategic one. So start with 
basic job descriptions. Often family businesses don't have defined job descriptions. People are just kind of jack of all trades. Just um, right. it's important to have job descriptions. And it's uh, from that, it's important to understand what each person's KPIs are and how they will be remunerated accordingly. And so where there's an instance of a family member not meeting specific KPIs, now we can start off with HR managing that, um, having conversations and seeing whether the, this family member can be coached, placed on a performance improvement plan. But where it's evident that it's detrimental to the business or to the family relationship for the family member to continue to be in the business, we need to start to have to think about difficult conversations of their exit. Um, and um, this would not just stop at HR. So HR would perform their normal third party, like as you would in a third party environment, um, but also then supplement with the personal conversations that this is not a personal rejection. It's a business decision. And Quite often, if we're aligned on the purpose of the business beyond dollars and cents, the wider purpose, by that I mean, is it to transform com communities? Is it to be a force for good? You know, um, if a family has clarity on that, chances are this family member would all, also buy into and enroll into this wider vision and would see it not as... Um, something personal, but something that's for the wider collective good. It might also be an opportunity to look at where would this uh, family member be best placed. It might not be on the battlefield of the family business, but, you know, what, working behind the scenes. There's so many elements of a family enterprise. Like I alluded to, the, the business of managing family money is a business. Um, you know, being a strategic advisor, just sitting on the board and advising on strategic opportunities that the family can um, pursue, looking at new investment opportunities, looking for new joint ventures. So the where folks can contribute is, you know, endless. So it might just be it's not a good fit in that regard. But if it's a character issue, if there's like, say, for instance, an integrity issue or there's an addiction issue that's impacting on, you know, the, the family and the business relationship, then we will need to think about some stricter boundaries and firmer boundaries. And that might be where you'd need to um, bring in the help of a family business coach or a therapist. I love that you gave all of those solutions and ways before, you know, saying, OK, just let the person go, because mm -hmm. I think that that would, of course, you know, have some effects on the relationship. So great advice. Yeah. Um, and what are some of the mistakes, you know, in your experience that you see most people make when it comes to running these family businesses and how can these things be avoided? Um, for first geners is they hold the businesses, often they hold the businesses too tight mm. and they are not really allowing for other people to make a stamp on it. Um, and it's really just their baby and it doesn't end up being a collective baby of the family and of the other stakeholders like the employees. So it's important to ensure that you're, you're creating an environment that's collaborative. Um, that allows for co-creation because the, the truth of the matter is if your children see that you're hugging this business so tightly, they can't get a word in, they can't influence you in any shape or form. They will not be interested in it. They won't care about it. They won't love it. And then that time may come where you want to move on to something else. And it's like, well, they don't really seem to be too interested in this business. They're going off doing their own thing. And you start to have a lot of anxiety about your what next. So, you know, your children might be legal owners of your business, but they, you have to groom them and cultivate emotional ownership where they truly care about the business. They feel they belong. Um, it gives them a sense of pride and joy so that they can contribute. So that's one thing I would say is um, your involvement is critical to the success of the business, but also be sensitive to creating a collaborative environment um, such that other people can make a stamp on um, the business. The other, like I said before, is start early. The earliest time, time to start was yesterday. Um, that's the best time. And the next best time is today. 
it's never too early to start your legacy journey. And by that, if you've got young children or um, any children, it just starts with exposing them to the business, um, starting to have conversations on the meaning of the business, the meaning of the family wealth, the meaning of the family name, the wider vision, um, the wider purpose. These conversations don't, uh, they're not routine. <laughs> they don't happen by osmosis. Um, these are conversations we have to plan for, plan time, plan emotional space, plan mental um, mental space and create a cadence for them. Um, so it's not just a one-off, perhaps it's once a quarter, once a year, maybe we go on a family retreat and we start to have conversations about this. Um, it's really important to start early. It's on the foundation of these conversations that your estate planning will you know, be laid upon, your wealth planning, your tax planning, and, and what have you. That without these conversations and having clarity on the meaning and the purpose, um, who is family, who would be a beneficiary, um, there are many philosophical things to explore. Yes. And that makes me think about, you know, the conversations around when you think about, I know here people were farmers in the early days. And now, you know, people are saying, OK, we're going to go to college. We don't want to come back and be farmers. But and then there are those who think about going away and coming back and saying, OK, I'm going to take over the family business in that way. But it's also about, you know, like what happened to here because I'm Southern. So it's like what happened to the young farmers, the people who are no longer interested in these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like that's gone. And I, I often think about what you just said is those conversations may not have been had and that involvement may not have been there. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. It's sad. But I also want to get a little technical in talking about, um, you know, you spoke about beneficiaries and, you know, different people coming into the family businesses, um, breaking down, you know, shares and equity and how can these be communicated from generation to generation? Mm. So this is where it gets legal and this is where <laughs> you might need a tax advisor and an attorney. But <laughs> generally, you want to make sure you do the legal transfers way ahead of time. Um, so you want to start to transfer the legal ownership to the next generation um, so they can start to feel a sense of responsibility because ownership is a responsibility. It's not um, it's not a free pass. Being an owner of a business, um, you need to understand fiduciary responsibilities, corporate governance, legal responsibilities. You need to understand how to read financial statements. You need to understand. Um, you need to understand, yeah, business strategy, business, business management. So you want to start that process as early as possible and also start a long-term kind of coaching and development process for um, your successors. So, so often what we tend to see is founders resist passing on shares to the children because they want control over the cash. Um, but the truth of the matter is if you, if, if heaven forbid, we don't do that and it's too late and they pass away, then there'll be tax. There could be tax, um, liabilities that crystallize upon transfer. Say if a will provided for, um, children and inheriting shares, there may be inheritance taxes, um, capital gains and all sorts. Obviously, this is depending on your state and depending on your particular situation. However, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's best to do this ahead of time, not only for tax reasons, but also, like I said, just to, to give them a sense of responsibility and start to understand what it means to be an owner. Yes. And, you know, I, I think about how early should um, in the business should people start to do these things? I think, you know, I don't think there's a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And like if they you you kind of test them right you give them small responsibility and see how they handle that and based on that you upgrade it and what have you so it's it's in my opinion it should be a measure of how responsible the child is say for instance you've got three kids mm -hmm. and um one's an addict and you know that giving them access to these shares will be detrimental 
to their welfare, then obviously that's sensitive. You don't want to just pass on those shares without, you know, limits or barriers and boundaries and things. Um, So it it really depends on the unique situation. However, I would say it should be gauged based on how responsible they are. Um, And ideally, you want to have a third party coach or mentor that's looking at, oh, hey, Johnny needs to work on his understanding of this industry or needs to work on understanding of trust and being a beneficiary or financial, um, personal finance management and things like that. Um, Ideally, you want to have a third party helping the successes as well. Got it. And I want to talk about some of the amazing things that you are doing at your firm, you know, to help businesses. Um, I know one of the things that you spoke about is bridging the gaps between the seniors and the younger generation. Um, So if you could just talk a little bit about how do you help solve these problems? Yes. um, So quite often there's gaps, generational gaps between the senior and the junior generations. Um, Like I said, the number of seniors find it difficult to let go and allow for other folks to have a voice and leave their stamp. And also a lot of senior folk find it difficult to let go because they know they have a lot of experience and expertise Mm -hmm. that the younger folks have not had. So it, it, it can be a challenge for them. And on the other side, you've got the younger folk that have different perspectives, um, you know, have, have different experiences and want to infuse their expectations and experiences to ensure that the family business um, stands the test of time. Um, so essentially what I do is I help the senior folks with moving from being bosses to being mentors. Um, so phasing out of this prominent roles they've had in their family businesses and being able to pass on increasing responsibility to the younger folk, um, as well as help the younger folk with communicating their ideas in a way that they'll be heard, preparing for um, leadership, um, grooming, um, such that they do have the right skills to take the family business to the next level. And that's how um, I help with bridging the gap. I'm Actually, at the moment, completing a book also on this called Lifetime to Legacy. Ooh, mm. love that title. <laughs> Thank you. So that will be out in January. Um, for folks that, you know, if you are you are a founder and you're starting your journey, you just want to know what you should be keeping in mind. Or even if you, you haven't really planned all this and you are at that point where you want to hand over, but don't know where to start or you are on the other side, you're a successor, you're a child and you don't know how to start these conversations on this. These are conversations on death, money and taxes, like all the taboo subjects in the world. Right. Like, <laughs> all rolled up into one. It's, it's, it, it can be tricky, um, but it's possible. I love that. I love it. I love it. And, you know, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is your own personal experience. Um, so you mentioned your uh, your father in construction. Mm-hmm. So how was that for you? Well, I guess, like shaped your perspective in terms of like learning those things and feeling that, OK, this is something that I want to teach other people. But is it something that you grew interested in? It was not my industry of choice. Uh-huh. And it wouldn't be. Um, but I think you grow to love something. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so glad for the experience because I started my career in financial services in London. And um, I would definitely not have chosen to start up a construction company, but so be it, right? right. Um, but it was a challenge. Um, and I'm always up for a challenge. I love learning. And it was a challenge because I was a young female in a very male-dominated space. Right. where out of my own choosing, I would never have chosen construction because I just would have assumed that there's no space for me. So what it did is more than anything, it gave me a benchmark that anything is possible. Um, possibilities are endless and I can do anything I want to do as long as I put my mind to it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and, and and I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship also being learning from my dad and seeing how he pivoted. He was a medical doctor when I was born. He was practicing medicine and um, spotted an opportunity to supply medical consumables to hospitals in Nigeria. And then over the years, moved into designing and constructing hospitals. 
again, that was then another example of anything you want to do, you can do it. Because right. he, he's yeah. definitely not an engineer. He didn't really know much about construction. So for me, it's that legacy of possibility pioneering um, of entrepreneurship. And when we when we talk about entrepreneurship, I think we 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 don't really understand the fullness of what it entails. We just say it so fleetingly. It's just entrepreneurs, they see things other people can't see. They build things um, based on strong conviction to provide significant value in a sustainable way to communities that they serve. And I think that's is so powerful. And for me, it's um it's it's it was very great training ground for the work that I do now because there were no <laughs> or there were no legacy planning experts around me. Um mm-hmm. and so I had to have that conviction that you know what, I can do whatever it is I want to do as long as I have that vision in my eye and I see possibility, um I can go for it. Yes. I, and I, I agree. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so excited for this conversation because, you know, I don't see people, you know, in the community speaking about this as much or someone that's an expert speaking about it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's important, like you said, to have these conversations, even though they are on taboo topics. But um, also, I wanted to get your perspective because I'm sure like people who are dealing with maybe they're feeling like that. I don't know. I don't want to say guilt. Mm. But it's just as if they have to do something uh, because it was passed down or just how to deal with that. Because like you said, learning to love. Mm. Yeah, I think. I think the worst thing we can do is do things out of obligation. Mm -hmm. And we must do things from a place of inspiration. And that's not to say inspiration can't be cultivated. Yeah. Right. Um, And it. And it can, and I think we we can have a natural kind of curiosity and open mindedness, and not be so fixed in our the way we look at things. So I think you know there's nuance to this, but on the part of founders, I would say don't make your children feel obligated, like they have to take over the business, they have to do this, they have to do that. Um, that's the worst way to inspire them to actually take an interest and develop. Um, keen interest or love for the business obviously it comes with responsibility um owning a house comes with responsibility there's maintenance work that needs to be done you know um so as future owners of the business it comes with responsibility but i would not belabor it over their heads like they have to be the next ceo and make them feel like um because there's a lot of imposter syndrome and insecurities they're dealing with that they probably won't voice to you um mm-hmm. not being entrepreneurs that builds this business from nowhere um, it takes a lot to be an entrepreneur it's it's intimidating to to those that are on the periphery and watching um so yeah it's important to just invite inspiration always always not love obligation mm. love that invite inspiration and speaking of entrepreneurship and, you know, it being sometimes a tough journey, what advice would you give to an entrepreneur in their first year of business? <laughs> Be prepared to hear no all the time. <laughs> um, it's you have to work from a deep place of conviction. Not confidence, because I think there's a difference. And often we, we're looking for confidence as that barometer or indicator of of we're on the right path you will be scared you will be um but you have to come from a deep sense of conviction what's the higher purpose um understand its value you're bringing to your market um spend time listening to your market and not in um you know, in an office or in your basement, curating ideas that haven't been tested by the market. Um, the best ideas are those that have been asked for explicitly by your market. So, yeah, I would say develop deep conviction, having spent a lot of time in the presence of folks that would be your ideal customers, deep understanding of where they're at, 
both their observable needs as well as as their psychographics, the way they think, um, the issues that they face, their deepest aspirations, just get plugged in and imbibe that. And, and yeah, just be persistent on the journey. It's not easy. Rome wasn't built in a day, um, but it's definitely doable. Agreed. And what is the best risk that you've taken in your entrepreneurial journey? Mm-hmm. Just doing. Um, clarity comes by doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but often we can get ourselves into a corner of analysis paralysis where we don't do, and we can't even know whether our ideas are good or not, or um, we just have to do. So just get out there and test test things. Um, apply a sense of playfulness to what you're doing. And by that, I don't mean being frivolous, <laughs> but I mean being curious and experimental. Every opportunity, everything you're doing or every outcome is an opportunity for learning. It's not an indicator of, um, you know, of your person. It's not a measure of the value or the worth of you as a person. It's just an invitation to learn. Love it. And um, I always like to ask um, any tools or resources that you can recommend that are your favorite and um, you can't live without. Community. Community. Mm-hmm. Get in community with other people on a similar journey as you, whether it's in like, your industry or just general entrepreneurs similar sphere of life um similar season of life rather um whether it's you're trying to raise capital or um get into community of entrepreneurs because um you find a sense of loneliness as you're building because if you're not surrounded by people that are entrepreneurs because it's it's it takes a different type of mindset you may find that you're drifting away from people that um you've known for many years and been close to for many years because you you have to upgrade your mindset. Um, so it's important that you get in community with people that are, that get it, um, that can be a source of support, um, source of learning, um, source of inspiration. Beautiful. And Nikkei, what does it mean to you to be Black in business? <laughs> To be black in business, that's a question that I did not anticipate. <laughs> For me, to be black in business is, I try not to think about it, but what it means to me is we have to normalize black opulence, black wealth, black richness, and that we're deserving of it. Because we've been told for too long that it's not for us, that certain rooms have everyone else at the table but us, and we've normalized our suffering. Um, And our history is full of a lot of suffering. Um, And that's not to say we turn a blind eye towards our suffering and our history and our presence, but I think we also need to normalize our exuberance our vibrancy our joy and so for me what it means to be black in business is normalizing that very joy that exuberance that vibrancy that color through normalizing you know um black wealth we deserve it we need it not only just um Wealth is good, <laughs> but also it's a tool to create the social change we need to see within our community. Mm. So beautiful. I love it. I love it. I, yeah, I always like to ask that question because I, I just love how, you know, it t- makes you think. But um, I love that answer. And this has been so great. So um, I want to give you the opportunity to let people know how can they find you? How can they support you and how can they work with you? Yes, you can find me on my website, www.nikaanani.com. 
And you can join my mailing list. I just have a, a monthly mail. Um, it's not spam, just sharing my thoughts on legacy planning. And it's really my primary way of updating folks on the book, um, which will be out in January. Um, I also have a podcast, Connect to Generation, where we explore legacy building, legacy wealth. And I invite both business owners that have been through it, are going through it, and thought leaders to share their thoughts on how to build legacy. So those are the primary ways of staying in touch. Lovely. Well, Nikkei, thank you so much for being on the show. And we appreciate everything that you've given us today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Wasn't that just wonderful? I love that Nikkei shared her own personal experience joining her family business and how it birthed a passion to help other families build legacy enterprises. I think that as Nikkei said, estate planning and longevity is something we should be thinking about early, especially if your goal is to have a business that outlives you. And I get it. These leaving the earth conversations are things that we don't want to have conversations about, but we have to make sure we're handling our business. So we have to have these types of conversations and do this types of planning. As a reminder, if you're currently running a family business or you're planning to start a family business, discuss clear expectations and boundaries up front. I hope that you found this conversation valuable and we appreciate you so much for taking the time to tune in. Visit blacktobusiness.com forward slash 71 for full show notes. And if you're not already, make sure you're following the podcast and be so kind to leave us a written review. See you next week. Same time, same place.